All right, I want to welcome you to Harvester this morning. Um, let me tell you that I used to have a love-hate relationship with, uh, you remember the GPS systems that you used to have in the vehicle before everything was included in your phones with maps and everything? So I used to have a love-hate relationship with them because in the early days, they made mistakes, actually. They would send you to places that didn't exist or streets that had, you know, no, uh, just they were like a dead-end street. And in fact, one of the last times that I remember like clearly that the GPS was wrong was the first time I came to, to this church, to Life Point at the time. And I, I lived in Florissant at the time, and the preacher, Jonathan, had invited me to come lead worship, and it led me to a street like right behind Avery Park, that if you follow it, it's behind those businesses, it's a dead end. And it said that if I took that, it would lead me to Cherry Street, and then that's where the church was at the time. And, and I remember like... I mean, like, this is completely wrong. I feel like I was going, you know, back through an alley. I'm like, this is shady. This is not a good sign. So I just turned around and, and followed. Now, since they have come a long way, right? Now, if you don't listen to your GPS or your maps or Siri or whoever you use, um, you are going to be in trouble. So yesterday I was uh, going to a soccer game, to coach a soccer game, and uh, we always, to get to this, these soccer fields from the highway, I always have to go around these farm, in farm fields. And so I thought, you know what? It, it, Siri is wrong. I'm going to go around a different way. Seven minutes later, I'm back around those farm fields trying to get to the soccer field, right? I just wasted seven minutes of my life because I didn't want to listen to it. So, so really, sometimes, you know, it's, it's good to listen to, to your maps because sometimes we think that the fastest route is the, is the straight path. But many times it isn't, because there are many factors to consider. And when it comes to our spiritual life, sometimes we think that the straight path is the easiest way to God. And so if I were to ask you, you know, what is your desire spiritual pathway graph? If you're like me, this is what it would look like. It looks like this, right? When you, when you say, I have decided to follow Jesus right here, he finds you, you never look back and you go straight ahead towards him you can't be a 10 because jesus is a 10 so you're like a 9.5 i'm okay with that right right before when i right before i die or before jesus comes back i'm okay with being a 9.5 the reality is this is not how it works right for most of us this is what our spiritual walk looks like it's just a little bit of that right but what if i told you that that isn't so bad what if i told you that this is actually what the holy spirit wants your spiritual pathway to look like and that's what i'm going to talk to you about there is this tension between going inward towards god and going outward back into the world with intentionality that exists for every follower of jesus we are going to wrestle with that and here's what i want you to know about how the holy spirit moves in all this okay the holy spirit's movement is rhythmic but you're not going to be able to predict it it's oscillating, but it is never aimless. Okay, I'm going to say that again because I think that's important. The Holy Spirit's movement is going to be rhythmic, so it's going to have cycles, but they're not cycles that are predictable. You can't say every three months I'm going to go into the world and then I'm going to come back to Jesus and, and back and forth. No, it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. And it's oscillating, but it's not aimless. Sometimes if you look at the, the graph that we just had a second ago, it's going to seem like, you know, you're just going in circles. But the reality is that there is intentionality by the Holy Spirit to sometimes send you outwardly into the world to help someone, to make a difference. And sometimes He needs to bring you in so you can re be refilled and you can spend time with, with God. And so that's what we're going to talk about. The, the, the reality is that Jesus lived a life in the flesh, like we talked about a few weeks ago, but he also lived life in the spirit. That means that Jesus modeled for us what it is like to live life in the spirit. And, and we're going to follow a pattern that we see in Mark chapter 6, you know, as we try to follow the spirit's leading. And so here is the question that I want you to wrestle with as we're talking about each element of the spirit's movement. I want you to wrestle with this question. Will I go... Where he, wherever he is sending me right now. Will I go whatever the Holy Spirit is sending you right now? Because really at the end of the day, it's about the movement that we take. 
The Holy Spirit can be sending you anywhere, just like a GPS tells you, I'm telling you where to go. It's still your choice to listen. And so that's the question that I want you to ask. Will I listen, okay? Here's how the Spirit moves us. The Holy Spirit sends us first outwardly to serve desolate people. When you come to Jesus, one of the first things that you're going to realize once you receive His love, you receive His saving grace, you understand that He came and died for us so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be bought again. That's called redemption. And then you realize that Actually, he wants us to go and, and, and tell more people about his saving grace. And, and the problem is that we kind of have become a church in place. In other words, um, there was a time probably in the late 90s, I would say, where churches decided that if we made a few changes to our services and we were culturally relevant, that things were going to change. And that's called the church, the attraction of church model. It, it just says... Hey, listen, we kind of, like, what was happening is that the, the people, the culture was changing, and the church's culture didn't change, and so we almost, when people walked into churches, it felt like they were out of place. It felt like, whoa, this is a world that's different, and so what someone said, decided, like, hey, let's look at our culture as a church, and let's change. If the music is changing, let's change with that. If this, you know, if, if some areas of our culture is changing, let's change with that, along with that, and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that we thought that that was what's solving the issues for the church. So people started coming and started liking church, and, and then the whole cool church movement kind of began. And, and the problem that happens with that is that we thought that that was the solution to it, when in reality, that's just like basically the starting point. We forgot that really how people grow is by teaching them, you know, God's Word. And one of the things that I really had to ask myself during the COVID-2019 you know, pandemic, you know, in, in 2020, is this idea of, you know, thinking through, have we done a good enough job? So, like, we couldn't meet for a while, and everybody was kind of separated. You know, would you have been able to disciple your own? Would you have been able to continue the mission of Jesus on your own and gather others? And, and this idea that really... You know, theology does matter, that knowing Scripture matters a lot, that being transformed matters, because otherwise we are just uh, sitting here. And here's one of the things that I think COVID-19 um, pandemic showed, that it showed the weaknesses of the church, the attraction of church model. It showed that when we have you here and we spoon feed you the word, and you don't go back home and, and do, you know, some Bible study on your own, you're going to become weak. It's like if you just ate once a week, do you think you'd have time to, you know, strength to work out or even do any of your regular activities? No, you wouldn't. So if you only get the Word of God here on Sunday mornings, I'm going to tell you, you are going to feel weak in the Spirit. And when you get hit by all the temptations of the world, there's no way no, you're going to stand a chance against them if this is all you get Sunday morning for 30 minutes. And so... So what I want you to know is that it showed those weaknesses, but it also showed, showed some good things. There's flexibility in God's church, right? So we kind of changed the way that we did things, and, you know, we went online. Some churches went online, and, you know, we had, I remember we had communion packages for families if they wanted to come by and just grab them and take them at home, and we did, met in smaller groups. And so, so not everything is bad, but here's what I want you to know. Jesus wants us to be a church on the move. He wants to mobilize his people, and that's what we're going to talk about here in a second. Now, why does he want to mobilize us? Because he wants to send us to desolate people, people who are hopeless and in desperate need of help. Now, that sounds a little bit harsh because you look around, and everybody seems fine right on the outside. They all, you know, some people drive nice vehicles, and you go to the store, and you wouldn't be able to tell if someone is a Christian or isn't a Christian just by looking at them. And so you think, maybe it isn't as bad as I think. But I want you to hear some of these numbers. 20 million people, 20 million people in the United States alone are experiencing depression. That's one in 10 adults, okay? 40 million people are experiencing different types of anxiety. 37 million people live in poverty. There were about 90,000 deaths related to alcohol last year. 
About every, every year, about 10 million men and women experience domestic violence in the United States. About 50 million have a worldview that does not acknowledge the existence of, a, of their Heavenly Father. In other words, there are about 50 million that claim to be, you know, some type of atheist or maybe deep, deep agnostic. That means there are 50 million people that do not know they have a Heavenly Father that loves them. They're fatherless. They're living life fatherlessly. And, and, and here's what I want you to know. This is in a nation that I think, you know, in spite of all the complaints that we may have, I'm going to tell you we live in a pretty good nation, in a, in a, in a beautiful country. And so, so people need the Lord. And I know that numbers are hard to grasp, but I just want you to, if, if any of these apply to you, raise your hand and leave it raised, okay? Do you know someone who has experienced depression, different types of anxiety, poverty, you know, who's experienced the, the issues that alcohol brings into a family, or domestic violence? You know, when you start raising your hand now, nearly everyone in this room has raised their hand at some point or another. So, so Jesus wants us to be mobilized because he wants to reach a people that is sometimes in need of his word, in need of his love. And, and, and the word desolate describes us when we are without Jesus. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to open your Bibles, please, in Mark chapter 6, verses, uh, we're going to start in verse 7. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to know we have some Bibles in the back under that little table that we have there. And uh, you're welcome to grab one, keep it if you don't have one at home. If not, maybe you have your devices, you can download the Bible app there. So Mark 6, 7 and on, says that calling the 12 to him, this is Jesus, he began to send them out two by two and gave him authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts, wear sandals, but, no, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And so Jesus sends them. And we are told a few things about, about his teaching, right? By the way, this is recorded also in the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, Jesus explains his mission perfectly. He says that they were to do two things. They were to pro proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. And so when you're thinking, when the Holy Spirit is sending you out into the world, what does he want me to do? He wants you to do two things. Either, you know, preach the kingdom of God, tell them about Jesus, tell them about the good news of why he is important in our lives, why no one should have a worldview without him considered. And number two, you know, see problems that people have, see issues, and, and help them. See the, sick, the sicknesses, the diseases that we have in our culture, and then try to heal them, be a part of a solution. In whatever way you can, in whatever way you have been gifted, Jesus is the one that has gifted us with different gifts. Use them to try to heal people. In whatever way. And, and when you do that, you need to do it in, in humility. So the first thing is you preach the kingdom of God, and then you try to heal people. And here's the second thing that he says, you need to, uh, to do it in humility. You don't have to have it all figured out, believe me. Many times, how many of us have stopped ourselves from talking to someone about the Lord because you think, I may not be able to answer every question they have. Or I don't know enough about the Bible, right? It's, it's common. I don't know enough about God. I'm going to tell you, you don't need to know everything. You know that these disciples have been with Jesus maybe two years, Max? How many of you have been Christians for at least two years? Raise your hand. You're ready to go. Jesus is saying, go. Go and, and preach the kingdom of God and heal people in whatever ways you can. That's all you need. And, and Jesus was telling you, you know, he told, told his disciples, only take one pair of sandals. So pick your Nike sandals or your Adidas set, whatever you have, and go. What Jesus is trying to tell him here really is to go in humility. You know, we don't have to come across as we have it all figured out. In fact, the, the apostles were to go to these villages and receive help from them as well. You know that one of the better, best ways to, 
to engage in a new relationship with, with someone, a friendship, is to simply maybe go and try to help them whatever way they can, but also be able to receive help from someone else into your life. We need to be humble as we are sent. And here's the last thing that Jesus said that we need to remember. He said, not everyone will listen. And if that's the case, that's okay. You can leave. You can move on to someone else. But here's what we cannot do. When someone doesn't listen, that doesn't mean that we need to quit preaching the good news and healing the people that we see around that we can help. It just means we move on to someone else. Many of us are stuck. You know, that's the problem. That we find ourselves stuck in spots because we think, Pastor, you don't know me. I tried and so and so ended the friendship. Or my family didn't want to hear anything. And the pastor told me that it would be great and, and it didn't work out. That doesn't mean that you have failed or that the word has failed. It means, you know, they weren't ready to listen. And if that's the case, Jesus says, you know, you're fine to move on somewhere else. But even Jesus was rejected. Listen to verse 6. Mark 6, verse 6. He was in his hometown in Nazareth. People that knew him. And here's what he said. The Bible says, he was amazed at their lack of faith. So then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. He moved on. Jesus moved on. I tell you, you cannot argue someone into heaven. So you just, when they, if they're not ready, then you just move on somewhere else. But the question is, when Jesus is sending you out, when you feel the prompting that you need to talk to someone, when you see someone who, who seems hopeless and desolate, will you move outwardly towards them? Will you step in faith towards them? That is the question at the end of the day. Jesus and the Holy Spirit will send you that direction. Will you listen to their GPS? Mark 6, uh, 32, we're going to keep reading. But, but first I want you to know, so one of the directions is outwardly towards desolate people. But the other one is inwardly. The Holy Spirit brings us inwardly to rest in desolate places. The Holy Spirit is going to send us inwardly or bring us inwardly to rest in desolate places. Here's what happens um, after Jesus sends the 12. They come back. Verse 30 says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because of so many people, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place place um, i love it that the disciples are so excited they come back and they report to jesus what they've done and man if you have ever served the lord you know that ministry is awesome it's like you get to be used and, and partner with with the god of heaven in serving others for his mission for his glory and for those of you who have been there you know that ministry has two stages right the first one is the, the what did i get myself into stage it's like when you realize that it's way above your pay grade, that you don't know enough, you don't have enough resources, and that maybe people aren't willing to help you. That's a moment where you sign up to do something, and then you realize, why did I do this again? And maybe people aren't responding to, to you needing help, and, and you don't know what's going to happen. But the second stage is the stage that we, where we say, God, thank you for letting me do this. In fact, uh, some of the ladies in the office and I were talking about this with our back-to-school fair. You know, it always feels overwhelming, and there's a lot to prep, and, you know, we need as many of you as we can. And we never know if it's just going to come, you know, quite together. But every time, it's amazing to see the smiles, to see the people on our campus walking around, getting to know each other. Uh, in fact, I just met a lady that said, you were being dunked, you know, a couple of weeks ago at Harvester Church, right? I'm like, yep, that was me. So in whatever ways, it's always amazing to see how God uses even the little things. And so this is where the disciples are. But here's another fact about ministry. It's like, it's never done. I've never heard a church leader or a pastor say, you know what? We've solved all, we have solved all the issues in our community. We have nothing left to do. Right? In fact, it's the opposite. We live in a lost and wounded world. The more effective that we become at filling people's needs, the more needs will follow us. And that's exactly what happened to the apostles. They go out, they preach. Jesus gives them the authority to heal. 
Guess what? They bring a crowd with them. And as we read, it says they didn't even have time to eat at this point. So what is Jesus' answer? Have you ever been in a spot where you don't feel like you don't even have time, where you don't even have time to eat? Have you ever been in a spot in your life where you're so busy, you're overwhelmed? This is where the apostles were at this point. And I love Jesus' answer. Here's Jesus' answer. He said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Man, I think if we just listen to the words of Jesus, if we could take him at his word when he tells us to do some things, I think a lot of our anxiety and anxious anxiety and, and maybe other things that, that we struggle with in our heads would go away. If we could just take some time and go with them by ourselves to a quiet place and rest in Him. I think it would change. And I, and I, want, you, I want to ask you this. Do you ever do that? Do you take some time to retreat with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, by yourself? And I know it's, it's hard for some of us. Now, for some of you, before I go into the why it's hard for some of us, for some of you, it just seems odd. But when I'm talking about this, you're like, wait, I don't even see Jesus. Where is he going to be? How are we going to meet if I don't see him? It feels maybe boring or overwhelming because maybe a couple of different reasons. One, you may be in a place where you don't believe that Jesus' presence can actually be with you. And, and, and that would be a reason why you don't think this is possible or this is weird. You know, maybe another reason would be you don't know Jesus that well. And that actually could be why you don't see, you know, this as a, an important thing for you to consider. So, of course, it feels awkward to spend time with the Lord. You know, you may be one of those that prays for a minute, you know, and, or you say, I'm going to pray for 15 minutes. And you find yourself two, three minutes later drifting off into something else or, you know, just like waiting to see how long it's been. And you realize, oh, it's only been a minute a prayer, and it feels awkward to you. It doesn't feel like it's natural. Well, that's not a problem. So here's what I want to do. I want to say, if you're the person that does not believe that Jesus' presence can be with us, I want, you to ch I want to challenge you to ask yourself why. It may be a worldview issue. It may be that your presupposition is that only the material exists. Right? That's what our culture is telling us, by the way. Only the material exists. And so if that's your worldview... Of course you're going to have a hard time believing in Jesus' presence being with you if you can't see him. Now, for some others, it's not a worldview issue. You believe in the spiritual world. You believe in, in what the Bible tells us about God. But the problem is that you have an unresolved issue with the Lord. Maybe you're upset because something didn't go your way. Maybe you feel like he didn't answer some prayers of yours. And that is in the back of your mind. And anytime you want to get close to Jesus... It gets on the way. So I just want you to ask yourself, why is this such an odd thing to do? Because in reality, it should be a natural thing to do. If we're saying we're spending eternity with Jesus, why not start now, right here, right now? But maybe if the issue is that you don't know Jesus that well, my encouragement would be to get to know him a little bit each day. See, when you are meeting someone new, you know, there's enough small talk to go around for a few minutes but after those few minutes, it's going to get awkward, right? Like you can talk about the weather in St. Louis, about the Cardinals, about the Blues, about what's going on, you know, right now that day. And then after that, you start running out of things to talk about, right? And how many of us have the same problem with Jesus? It's like we have the few prayers that we say every day and the thing that's in our heart for that day. And you're like, I don't have anything else to say. I'm going to tell you, just keep coming back the next day. When you talk to someone new... You get to know them here and there every day. And before you know it, you can actually engage in a true conversation. And before you know it, you can actually, if they, you find them to be trustworthy, you can confide in them a little more. And so is it with Jesus. We need to spend time with them a little bit even every day, but on a regular basis. And this may be the answer to many of our emotional and mental issues that we have. Now, Having regular time with Jesus is so important. So then why, I think, do so few people do it? Why is it that we don't do it, that we don't spend time with Him? I'm going to tell you why. Probably for one of three reasons. So more than likely, all three of them, okay? A combination of all three. Probably because, number one, we are, as a, as a society, overscheduled. We are overly busy. 
um, it's one of probably my biggest faults is that I cannot say no. And so now that I'm telling you that, I'm going to hold you accountable. Do not ask so many things because I can't say no. You're like, I can just go with Pastor Gus. He's going to say yes, right? So I can't say no. And, and I'm working on that. In fact, I was talking to Jay last, time, last week about this, about how sometimes we have to say no to some good things so that we can say yes to better things. And, and if I can be completely honest with you, right now I'm feeling, uh, I'm on, in a stage in my life where I'm feeling a little bit emotionally maxed out. You know, with, uh, I think there's just enough going on in my play, just with church and, and family and sports and raising teens. And also, you know, I'm trying to resolve some emotional issues from losing, you know, my mom and, and a few other things. It's like, I'm feeling maxed out. And, and so I'm trying to find space. I'm trying to say no to some things. So that I can maybe say yes to other things that will fill my, my heart again. That will make me have that emotional, you know, space. And so you need to do the same thing. But we are overly scheduled. And you're going to have to make decisions, right? We can be victims and say, well, just let your calendar take you wherever it will go. You have to make a choice. Just, again, Jesus is telling you where to go, what the solution is. But you have to say yes to him. Now, here's another problem. Not only are we overly scheduled, but we carry the world everywhere with us in our pockets. We carry the world everywhere with us. Let me ask you this. How many of you carry this device into the bathroom even? Don't raise your hand. I want to be able to shake it afterwards. So don't raise your hand. Keep it down. But yes, we do, right? We even take it there because we can't spend five minutes without being, you know, somehow having some kind of input into our minds. And so, so here's really what I want you to, to practice this week. And this is going to be probably the hardest thing that you'll do this week, okay? But we talk about this often and we laugh about it, but we don't do anything about it. Will you commit to putting the phone down for a few minutes this week? And if you do, I want you to raise your hand right now. Okay, so here's the next thing. There's lots of it. So here's what I want you to do on Friday. If you have any type of social media... I want you to find me on Facebook or Instagram, and I want you to put, uh, tag me, and then put how many minutes each day, and that you did it, okay? Because this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to train ourselves. It's called discipline. The Holy Spirit gives us self-control. It's one of the, it's the fruit of the Spirit. But we have to start, and we can keep each other accountable, right? And so I hope I get lots of tags at the end of the week on Friday when you've done this for at least a little bit. And this is just so you can test how, what it is like to retreat from the world and, and to go somewhere. And here's the last part about why it's hard for us to, to go with Jesus by himself in our, in our culture. Because we are used to being entertained. Our attention span is so little. Now, by the way, did you know that the human attention span is actually only lasts a few seconds? But we have the ability, especially as we get older, uh, to re-engage. And so, you know... You engage for a few seconds, take a quick mental break of a second or two, and then you re-engage. And you do that hundreds of times each day. Um, at least most of us do, right? Some of us are just like all over the place. But here is actually the attention span. It's about 8 to 12 seconds. Now, on a regular basis, uh, studies said that in 2000, in the year 2000, the, the human span was 12 seconds long. In 2015, another study was done, and it says it's 8.25 seconds Long. So it's decreased, and this is probably because of the way that we're used to being entertained and how fast-paced media is for us, the, 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 the information that's coming at us. Now, what I thought it was interesting is that, did you know that a goldfish attention span is nine seconds? So we basically have the attention span of a goldfish, um, and that's probably true. Now, the average person, here's something else, the average person reads only 28% of the websites they visit. So when you open a website and you see all the text, you're only going to skim through about 28% of it, and you're going to move on. And did you know that the average watching time of, on a single video on the internet is 2.7 minutes? Which is why when you're going to post something on Facebook, a video on Facebook, a lot of times if, if you do it from an organizational standpoint, it tells you post a three-minute video because they know how long people watch. And so, so what I want you to, to, to think about is, what would it look like? And we're going to talk probably more about this next week, but here's, I'm going to give you just a, a snippet. Here's what it looks like. It, you set up some time 
either in the morning, in the afternoon, or the evening. Whatever works best for you, it doesn't matter. Whatever works best for you. You set up some time. You set up a place. Where is it that you're going to be unbothered for those few minutes, okay? It's at your bedroom. It's at uh, uh, enough your office. It's at the basement. It's at the backyard. Where is it that you can be alone for a few minutes? And then here's all I want you to do. I want you to sincerely pray to, 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 to God and talk to him like you would talk to a, a friend, to a confidant, and just tell him what's going on in your life. And then I want you to take a little bit of scripture, maybe one verse, not even a chapter, maybe just one verse. And Scott was talking about this last week a little bit. Just pick a small section of scripture and then ask God to speak to you through it maybe. And then just ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to give you joy, to give you peace, to ease your anxieties, to give you hope, whatever it is that you're needing. And then you move on with your day. And you can do any combination of any of these things. Sometimes it's more prayer. Sometimes it's a little more reading. Sometimes you're just resting in His presence and say, God, I need you. Would you come fill me? The question is, can you move inwardly to a quiet place? Will you do it this week? Now, here's the last thing, the last movement of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit sometimes is going to insert interruptions to develop dependence on Him. He's going to insert those interruptions into your life. No one likes interruptions, do, do we? I, this is actually one of my pet peeves, but uh, the Holy Spirit, I think, sometimes interrupts me on purpose to make sure that I'm trusting Him and I'm not trusting myself. Listen to what happens, Mark 6, as they are trying to get to a solitary place. Here's what happens. It says, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. So Jesus, here's what, I'm going to show you this picture, this map. Uh, they were in the, in the Israel side over here on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus had sent them all over Galilee to preach. And then once they came back to Jesus, they came near Capernaum, and then they said, Jesus said, let's retreat, right? And so they went to a desolate side. This was a desolate side. Not, not much was here at the time. And the Bible says that the people saw them leaving from Capernaum, and they went around and beat them to a place. And this is what it looks like, you know, just when you put a little bit of the topography there, you know, the Sea of Galilee and their surrounding mountains. And so they go all around, and they find probably a place near a mountain, and so here's what this place looks like. It looks like this. There's a shore, and then there's a mountain. So probably most scholars think this is the place where Jesus fed the 5,000. Which, by the way, did you know that this is the only event other than the resurrection that's recorded in all four Gospels? So this was a big deal. Because it wasn't really just 5,000 men. It was 5,000 men, but probably a one-to-one -one ratio of women. That's 10,000. And at least a one-to-one -one ratio of kids. So we're talking about 15, 20,000 people. Now, you've been to an arena with 15 or 20,000 people. There's lots of people everywhere. So picture Jesus getting on the boat and seeing all these people. What would you do? If you have not eaten in a long time, you're exhausted from doing ministry and serving people, you're going to do exactly what the apostles did. It's like, oh, here we go. Jesus is going to start teaching again. And if you think I go along... Jesus goes even longer. The Bible says, even in the evening, this is the evening, right? And the apostles finally say, Jesus, time to go home. They need to go and buy themselves some food. And Jesus says, no, I want you to feed them. Okay, what do you do when you're interrupted by the Holy Spirit? Are you annoyed by it? Or do you see, are you at least curious to see what God is doing through that interruption? In fact, I love what Doyle says about this. Doyle says, there are very few interruptions in our lives. For the most part, they are divine appointments. And are you aware of those divine appointments in your life? As we finish, um, here's what I want you to know. To follow the Spirit's move, you don't need to be a predictor. 
You just need to be present that day. Okay, many of us have this tendency, it's like, I need to know where I'm going. I don't know, Lord, show me where you're going to send me next week, where you want me to be. And we spend so much time asking, you know, what he's going to do, and we are not present to do it. I want you to know, all you need to know is what he's wanting you to do today, and then tomorrow, and then the day after. You don't need to know what he's going to do with you in a week or a month or a year. Simply say yes to him today and be present today. You know, by our standards, this would have been a horrible retreat for the disciples, right? They go out away to retreat by themselves. There's people coming. They have to feed people and serve them. Like, that's a horrible retreat. But that's exactly what Jesus wanted. And, and he was ready to send them back out. Let's read verse 45 of chapter 6. It says that after he, he fed the 5,000, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of them to Bethsaida. While, they dis, while he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. So Jesus not only asked his disciples to retreat to solitary places, he modeled it as well. He lived what he preached. And I think we need to do the same. We know God's word, but we need to live it out. And so here's what I want you to do. Some of you are really going to be inclined to serve, serve, serve. Go to the world and serve in whatever way, and you're going to get stuck there. And I want you to be aware of that so that you can listen to the Holy Spirit when he sends you inwardly to a place by yourself where it's okay to be without noise and without anyone else bothering you. And, and you don't have to prove that you are worthy because you're serving someone else. For some others, you love the being by yourself part. You love the Bible study and highlighting your Bible and going to Bible studies and watching videos on it. And to you, the Holy Spirit sometimes is telling you, Okay, you know all this, but are you doing anything with it? You know all this scripture, but are you really caring for people? You need to go out where they are and, and, and serve them. And the reality is that there is no formula for any single one of us. You just have to be present that day. If you keep reading the book of Mark, some amazing things happen. But the pattern is the same. Jesus sends the disciples to do something. As he's sending us to do something. He asks us to come back. He's going to debrief during that time of solitude and silence, and he teaches us things, and then along the way, we're going to get interrupted just like they did. But I tell you what, the Holy Spirit keeps showing up when we keep showing up. The question is, can you go whatever he sends you? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, just uh, who you are, and Lord, how our walks with you are so, they see unpredictable for us. But, Lord, I know that you are aiming at different spots in our hearts that need work done. Father, I know that you are leading us and guiding us so that we can go, each one of us, in our individual pathways, Lord. We can walk the road that you have traced before us. So, Father, I pray for the courage that we would say yes. I pray for the awareness that we would know when, Lord, uh, we don't want to go some places with you. And, Lord, that we wouldn't get stuck in our relationship with you but that we can continue to grow, Lord. And Father, as we do so, um, give us the humility to know that we are all on a different journey with you, to be encouraging to one another, and Father, to continue to grow uh, as we seek you together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.